level of preparation because a lot has to do with strategy on the GRE um, and um, yeah and, and um, being theoretically sound except for vocabulary um, it is not really important when it comes to the GRE again all this will be addressed I, I will um, go through quite in depth into all these points and help you understand what exactly the GRE is and how to address uh, challenges in that um, that our PPT is live uh, that's good news uh, um, so let, let me ask you a few more questions, right? So most of you had selected that you have not taken the GRE. Um, let's see. Here's another question that I'd like you to ask. I'd, I'd like to answer. Now I can see them too. Thank you. Okay, that's good. Most of you are looking to immediately take the GRE, um, and most of you a little further than that, okay? Um, so I'm guessing that the others are looking for next year's uh, September intake, I'm, I'm guessing. Um, e either way, it's, a, it's always a good idea to prepare and take the GRE as early as possible, because remember, the GRE is valid for five years, um, and the earlier you take it, the more uh, options you have to, um, to sort of decide or put your best foot in. Again, I will talk more about that. A um, couple more questions. There you go. Again, thanks for your patience and answering and giving me this input about you. This is really helpful. Is it true that many of you have gotten a 310 plus? I see that about five of you have answered that uh, you've gotten over a 310. I'd like to know what your experience was. Also, Monica, you had asked about um, how to deal with verbal. Well, this session is essentially for that. You're in luck today because today is all about how to deal with verbal. I'll talk about strategies uh, to, to break through the, each of the question types. And also, I will talk about um, how to deal with reading comprehension, strategies that will work every single time. That's good. Okay, Syed, uh, th that's usually un atypical of students that usually meet is that um, they have a really high GRE verbal score, um, but um, really low verbal scores. Um, so let's see how we can work with that. Can you give me your split, if possible, if you don't mind, Syed? Okay. Um, the last, last poll of socks. 159 and 123 in that's a, that's a reasonably good split. Um, I mean, you want to be gunning for about a 165 in quant and 155 in verbal to get your uh, 320 plus score range. Um, again, how we get that, we will talk about that, right? Um, although I will not be concentrating too much on quant today, but there will be certain strategies that are relevant to the test taking um, or taking the GRE as a whole on the day of the test. Um, and that will definitely help you out to improve your score even without learning anything new. Uh, learning any concepts or learning any theory new. Um, so those test taking skills will be very, very useful on the day of the test. Okay. Um, so, got a good number of attendants. All right. So that said, again, introducing myself, I am Ajit Pira. I'm co-founder um, of uh, Plus Prep. Um, we are a test preparation company and also uh, we provide other programs for communicative English and business communication. We also help students with their admissions. Um, we've had a lot of success stories with us, with our students. Um, and I'd like to share this, the, the, the sort of the secret sauce that helps our students get <coughs> uh, the amazing scores that they get. Um, and that's essentially what we're going to do today. So let's look at the agenda for today. And again, please feel free to ask questions um, impromptu on the chat. I may not answer it right away. Uh, but I will definitely take time to answer them. And that I will give you specific time or specific sections in this webinar 
uh, for Q and A in itself. So yeah, so if you have any elaborate questions, any in-depth questions, please be, feel free to answer it in that time frame. Great. So what is today's agenda or today about? Well, we are going to look at a few things. We are going to look at um, you know, how to, essentially we're going to learn how to understand the mechanics of the GRE from a test maker's perspective. And that is something that I will want you to understand because very few uh, truly understand this. Um, and there is very little information online that's authentic and um, yeah, that's authentic and useful for students. Um, and understanding the mechanism of the GRE from test maker's perspective will help you understand how to deal with questions and what to prioritize while you're taking the test. Another thing that I will be discussing is the key test taking strategies to maximize your score. This, of course, is based on the mechanism itself and how you can utilize that to your advantage. Um, we will also identify some of the biggest challenges you will face on the day of the test. Um, we will learn effective ways to deal with such challenges on the day of the test. Um, so I will give you solutions um, that we can sort of um, preempt and resolve even before you have to deal with the actual problems themselves. We will understand how vocabulary tested on the GRE. That's, that's very important, right? A lot of people are here to address that. Again, in the, um, in the test that I released, in the assessment test that you've taken, um, some of the biggest concerns that a lot of you had was that your vocabulary uh, was quite frightening. Um, and I empathize with that. I've, I've been in that side of the boat, to call it that. Um, and I've had a lot of students who come in with that perspective. But it really isn't. And there are very easy and very fun ways to make vocabulary meaningful. Um, and also learn them effectively. And I will discuss those some of those strategies. Um, you will also learn some highly effective ways to build vocabulary, like I said. Um, also, we will understand the true nature of reading comprehension. So what is actually tested? What do, they, what do they expect from you? What are the things that you do wrong? Um, and all these things will be discussed on the um, in the session. There will be a separate module for that. And finally, we will learn some high impact strategies um, to read effectively, to read critically and effectively on the day of the test. And these are very important to ensure certain things, to ensure that you complete the test in time and also you are accurate and get the best possible score that you can. Great. Um, Jules, if there's any messages, let, just let me know, right? Okay, so let's talk about the GRE. So let's talk about the mechanism of the test, uh, technique strategies, and this might sound to most of you where you would have done these or you would have read up about these, but I don't want to leave any stones unturned. I will not be spending too much time analyzing this, but I but for whoever is uh, sort of a novice in the GRE world, um, I do want to give you an idea of what you're up against. So when you do take your GRE, the actual GRE or your mock test, um, here are the different sections, scored sections, and the unscored sections that you're likely to see. So to start with, uh, you will be faced with something called the analytical writing assessment. Um, these are essentially essays. You have two tasks of such essays, one being the issue and one being the argument task. Um, what they are, I will talk about in just a minute. Now, each of these are 30 minutes long and they're scored from zero to six. Now, my suggestion to you is gun for a mediocre score, gun for a score of four to 4.5. Um, don't bother about getting a 5.5 .5 or a six. Um, you may be surprised that I say that. Well, the thing is you don't have to get a high score unless you're applying for a literature or a fine arts program in the US. Uh, which, which is usually rare uh, for Asians and other um, and, and people from other countries. Um, it's usually Europeans and people from the United States who want to do fine arts in you in, in U 
this colleges. Um, so if you are someone who is from a literature background and who's looking to do um, a, a program of that sort, maybe your requirement might be around a six, but for everyone else, um, your requirement will be around four to four point five. Why gun for that and why not try to get a six? Well, think about this. You're going to be spending one hour of your initial test taking writing essays. And this can be a tedious task if you apply your mind into it completely, 100%. What happens if you do apply yourself 100% to get a six? Well, you'll be left with very little mental resources for the rest of the actual test, which is the verbal and the quant. That is not an ideal situation. You want to score as high as possible in these two sections. So then why if 4.5 oh, is okay? Well, like I said, it's not a selection criteria, but if you get something below two or three, then that might be a concern. Um, and therefore, what I would suggest um, is that, what I would suggest is that you aim for a four, 4.5 and get it. And again, to get a four or a 4.5 is not very difficult. It's quite straightforward if you understand what the GRE is looking for. Um, that said, the, looking at the two tasks themselves, the issue task and the argument task. The issue task essentially is a task that uh, asks you to write um, an opinionated essay, if you may. Um, so think as if you're a journalist of sort uh, who is writing his opinion about a particular perspective. Uh, that, that, that's something that sounds familiar, right? You've probably done something like that before, probably in college or in school. Um, and that's, you essentially take a side and stick to it. In an argument essay, well, this is something that you may not have uh, come across in your life before. Um, you are supposed to analyze something called an argument. Now, an argument is an opinion that is based on reasoning. So perhaps a mayor wants to build a new metro system um, so that his citizens will be, um, will, will, you know, will be more uh, serviced and they will be able to get to work quickly. And for that, he intends to raise taxes. Right. Um, so, sure. I will. I will share the PDF with you later on. Right. Um, so, essentially, the argument um, is not something that you're used to. It's not your. everyday debate or a disagreement um, that we have in everyday life. It's a critical reasoning argument. And this uh, sort of uh, has a lot of co comparable qualities of the critical reasoning question type with a uh, critical reading. So this is different. This is this essentially you need to think like a lot. You need to find loopholes and assumptions made. Um, and uh, right a response elaborating those assumptions and loopholes. That's essentially what the an, uh, analytical argument task is. Again, there's a very clear set of rules for what the GRE is looking for. And if you can satisfy them, you will be able to get a um, you will be able to get quite a reasonably good score. Um, so once you finish this section, the next section that you will see is the um, is the verbal or the quant section. It could be either of those two. So let me look at the verbal section. There are. Uh, That change. Sorry about that. Um, so looking at the verb verbal section, you will have twenty questions per section um, and two sections of verb. verbal. 
these may not come one after the other. They'll be jumbled. Um, and um, well, and you have 30 minutes for these 20 questions. The score range, of course, is 130 to 170. Um, we will talk more about the different question types and, um, and the distribution of the questions in the slides. So uh, an ideal uh, score component um, or a score that you should be getting is about a 155 um, in your verbal. Is it still breaking? Okay. Um, Hi, Pranit. Um, sorry to disturb us. Sorry to cut this, um, cut this presentation short. Uh, is that a problem that everyone has? Am I not audible? In a sense, am I audible? Am I not audible? No problems? OK. Um, so for the others, please check your bandwidth. If there are any, um, any um, downloads on the site, that might affect um, the audibility because that that probably if it's breaking it's probably because of that so please shut down any um, any any downloads that's on the side that should sort of fix it because I don't I don't really think it's a problem for my side because I have nothing else connected um, I, if if it persists just let me know we will have someone take a look at the uh, domain Okay, so um, coming back to verbal reasoning, like I said, there are 20 questions, 30 minutes, 130 to Ideally, you want to score a 155. Now, you'll notice that quant in general has a little bit more time. per question uh, than verbal um, and um, well it's also score from 130 to 170 and the ideal score is about a 165 again i am saying this considering the demographics that we are um, most of you are asian which i guess is true most of Your Asian, um, and the thing is that in Asia, the the average score for quant uh, tends to be around 160. So you want to be above average, but the average score for verbal is quite low. It's it's below 150, right? Um, may not be extremely. High. And also remember that you are um, applying for technical courses most of the times. If it is not a technical course, if it's not a software related or IT related program, um, but it's more
humanity is a literature base, then you may be required for a higher, required, a, required to get a higher verbal score on a lower point score. But this is generally true for about 99% of the students who take the test, and, and therefore those numbers. So if you're someone who's doing engineering, looking to do a you know, specialization abroad, these are the numbers that will work for you, right? Uh, and this will get you to that nice um, 320 plus score. And remember, 320 is a really good score. Even Harvard and Stanford will accept the score of 320 although they may reject you for other reasons. They are very, very picky about the kind of candidates they want, and therefore they give a lot of weightage to the profiles of these candidates. Great, so also what you'll notice is that there's something called a non-scored section, an experimental section. Now the experimental section can either be verbal or quant, um, and therefore what you will see is you will see two essays, uh, two verbal, two quant, and one experimental, which is either verbal or quant. How would you know that it's experimental? Well, there is no way to know. If you saw three verbal sections in your test, one of those was experimental. Um, there is no way to know which one was experimental, right? Um, the thing is, it does not affect your score in any way. Uh, these, the, the, how you perform there is, is a secret. No one is going to know how you perform in that. Nobody, in fact, it's purely for research purpose. So why make you spend 30 to 35 minutes doing a section that doesn't count? Well, um, it's because GRE is a standardized test. Um, and because it's standardized, they want to ensure that everyone has a fair opportunity, that the test is not biased. And every question that a student sees Um, has been vetted for accuracy, that it will reflect the correct kind of score, and it's testing the right kind of cognitive ability that they want to test. Um, and therefore, the experimental section will ensure that future questions that, are, that will be thrown into the pool of questions are researched, are experimented on these students to ensure that they satisfy all these conditions, that they are not biased, that they are fair questions, right? Um, so even though it may seem as if it's an unfair thing to have you spend 30 to 35 minutes on an experimental section, do know that it creates a very good testing system that is reliable. Um, fair enough. So one thing you will notice here is that you will, when you calculate the time, when you include the breaks, and when you look at the entire test experience as a whole, you have one hour of essay, one hour of verbal, one hour of porn, half an hour of, um, um, of an experimental section. Um, so that brings it to about three and a half hours plus of breaks. Uh, co combined with the registration process will take you about 30 minutes. Uh, so that's about four to four and a half hours of, um, of testing experience, right? When was the last time you spent four and a half hours taking a test? The answer probably would be never, right? And remember, this is not the kind of test where you can sit and zone out for a few minutes. You have to be completely focused through the entire four hours. 
um, you can you just cannot afford to zone out or um, take a break in between or when a section is going through um, because that will jeopardize your score substantially. So that's one of the biggest concerns that if the stamina required to go through or to may do justice to this test. Secondly, the fact that it it is a really strenuous, it is a really stressful experience sometimes if you're not prepared for it. Right. Um, so again, how do we deal with that? I will talk about that in a bit. Again, if there are any questions about the structure. Do let me know. Okay, so this takes me to the next aspect, which is um, how the testing algorithm works. So the GRE is not a, it is not a well a linear test. It's not a paper pencil test. Um, what it does is that it adapts on a stage wise level. So verbal one is stage one, verbal two is stage two, quant one is stage one, quant two is stage two. And the second stage depends entirely on how you did or how you performed on the first stage. Um, so let's say you um, you did the first section really well. You probably got an eighty percent in the first section. Then the second section will be a hard section, right? The the difficulty of the section as a whole will be hard. But if you perform sort of mediocrely, you'll probably get a medium section where the average difficulty of the entire section is medium. Let's say you performed really badly, you know, 25% of the questions in the first section were answered right, then you'll be thrown an easy section. So your rationale would be, why would I want to solve everything right in the first section and get a really hard section and suffer there? Um, because obviously the time per question and the time per section is not going to change based on the difficulty of the section as a whole. Um, so instead, you would say that a better strategy is to just, you know, perform mediocrely in the first section and get everything right in the second section so your total number of questions right is more. Well, um, although that sounds like a good ideal situation, that's not the case. The GRE is an adaptive test, like I said, and what that means is that a lot of weightage is given to the first section. It sort of sets you up for the kind of level that you're going to score Um, in, in the overall section. So to give you an analogy, um, so to give you an analogy, this is how um, the GRE um, scoring works. For example, if I have a room of 1,000 students, right, and I want to check their intelligence levels. Um, I could give them a question, a questionnaire of 100 questions and then grade them, right? Um, what I realized is that about 100 students got everything right, about 100 students got everything wrong. So now I have 100 students who are in the very intelligent category and 100 who are very dumb category. Um, is there any way to know which of these 100 in the, in the, in the intelligent category um, is more most intelligent versus least intelligent within those hundred. There is no way. Similarly, there is no way to find out if a um, if a if a student in the hundred um, people who did not score any of the questions right. Uh, we do not know who's the most competent, the least competent. Um, and as a result, um, you may have to create a question that's about thousand. thousands of questions long to really grant, you get a granular data of um, what the difficulty levels are. So instead, if I did what the GRE does, I give a questionnaire of 50 questions to students, um, which is of medium difficulty, moderate difficulty, on average. 
and um, I correct the questions as soon as they complete it. And once they complete it, I segregate them into intelligent. Group, um, the sort of mediocre group and the dumb group. And to each of these groups, I give them different question papers. The, the intelligent group, I give them a really, really difficult question paper. Uh, the mediocre group, I give them an average question paper. And the dumb group, I give them a really easy question paper. Um, and now, can I figure out who's the most dumbest and the most intelligent in the intelligent group? Um, absolutely, I can. So I can have really good, really granular data about the students themselves. And that's essentially what the GRE does. When you perform really well on the first section, which is of a medium difficulty, um, um, it puts you in the intelligent group. And even if you do not perform well in the second section, you're still one of the intelligent people, the high performing or high ability people. And therefore your score is going to be much higher than if you fall in an easy group and get everything right there. So you will still be the dumbest, um, and sorry, you'll still be the most intelligent in the dumb group. You'll still be in the dumb group and you don't want to be that. Um, and therefore the idea is to get as many questions right in the first section as possible. So it, it's, it's easy said in theory, correct? That uh, you wanna get everything right in the first section as possible, but how do, you, how do you satisfy it? How do you make sure you get that done on the day of the test? Well, to address that, let me show you a few things, or yeah, let me show you a few things about the test itself. So here are some mechanisms uh, that you should know. If you've taken the test or a mock test, you will know these things already. Throughout the test, you'll see this bar on top of the screen. What's important here is the review and the mark button, right? Um, so let's see how to use them and when to use them, but here are some other features. There is no negative marking on the GRE. So you get a question wrong, you don't get a negative marking. You're only scored for the questions you get right. You may attempt each question within a section in any order. So within the 20 questions that you have, you can do it in any order you want. You can start from the 20th question and then you know, go to the first question. You can change your answers. Again, assuming that you still have time, you can change your answers. Every question within a particular section is valued the same. Now, what I mean by that is the first verbal section, I told you, will be a medium difficulty. But that does not mean that every question will be medium difficulty. Rather, the average of all the questions will be medium. So you will have a distribution of easy, medium, and hard questions throughout. Um, so even if you attempt a hard question in a medium difficulty section, you'll be valued the same as answering an easy question. Right? I will explain more of this uh, in the next slide. Um, furthermore, you may skip mark or review questions with each, uh, within each section. So the mark button essentially is like your flag button um, and it has to be used as frequently and as often as possible and as early as possible ideally. Um, so can you can anyone tell me when you should use the mark button inside your verbal of one section and which situation or circumstance should you use it? Uh, I've got it. Thank you. Absolutely. When do you use the review button? The review button is like a flag button. Um, Um, the review button is like a flag button and um, you can use it on the day of the test. So, sorry, I'm not talking about the review button, I'm talking about the mark button, right? Um, the mark button is like a flag button. Uh, the review button shows you how you performed um, each of those questions, whether you've skipped them, whether you've marked them or the answered them. So my question is, when do you use the mark button um, during the test? Should you use the mark button if you've already spent two minutes um, on a question or should you use it in the first 10 to 15 seconds of seeing a question? A or B? I would appreciate responses. Okay. 
when you want to check answers or guess, how much time have you spent with that question? 10 seconds after marking a guess. Fair enough, that, that is actually a good strategy. So remember that time is of essence on the GRE. Um, you have about 1.5 minutes per question on the verbal section. So if you've already spent three minutes, uh, you hit the mark button on a question and you come back and spend time on it, you're essentially eating away time that you do not have, right? Uh, and you're missing out on other opportunities where you could be getting other questions right, but you're jeopardizing that. Instead, use the mark button for uh, questions that are very tricky. Um, so let's say that uh, you, you see a complex math problem. You know how to solve it mathematically, but you know it's going to take you a lot of time. Hit the mark button immediately, right? Because you know how to solve it. You can figure out some intelligent way to do it, but you're not able to see it right away. Hit the mark button, go to the next question, get the e next question right if possible, right? The key is to isolate easy and medium questions and get them all right. And then come to your hard questions and use strategic guessing to get as many right as possible. This might sound counterintuitive where in your academic days, you would be rewarded more for answering harder questions, but that's not the case here. Within a section, every question is valued the same on the GRE, irrespective of whether that particular question is easy, medium or hard. So the idea is that even if you get only the easy and medium questions right, if you get all of them right, you're still getting 66% of the questions right. That will take you to a hard section, right? And that will get you a score of 150 plus without even attempting one hard question. Um, although I don't recommend that strategy, this is just an extreme situation, an extreme example to illustrate what I'm trying to say. So the key here is choose your battles. Don't value every question equally. If it's a hard question, you want to approach it strategically and not do the hard work to get to the answer because you just don't have the time to spend um, and waste on. In a sense, you want to get as many questions right as possible. So to illustrate this, let me show you an example. Um, so this, these are the attempts. Two, two students attempt a mock test. And let's say for our comfort, it doesn't have 20 questions, but it has nine questions because you know 20 questions is a long list. Um, and I'm breaking down the time accordingly. So nine questions, 12 minutes, this is the first verbal section. And this first verbal section is medium difficulty. Um, and also as a result, you'll see that the questions are distributed from easy, medium, and hard. There are two ways to approach this. This is assuming that X and Y are both uh, high competency or um, you know, more than above average competency uh, students. Um, they could essentially get every easy and medium question, right? And they could get every hard question right if they spent about four to five minutes. And this, this is the truth. If you want to really work out a hard question, either in verbal or quant, it's going to take you about four to five minutes. Um, so let's see what each of their approaches. Each of them are different kind of test takers, and let's see what happens. So X um, looks at question number one. It's an easy question. He takes one minute. That's the time it requires. He gets it right. Um, second one is a medium question. He gets it right. Third one is a hard question. He, he, you know, he, he buries his knees and he's like, I need to get this right. And he uh, gets it right after spending five minutes. Um, fourth question is easy. Fifth question is easy. Yes, those right. Sixth question is hard. But if you calculate the time, he's already exhausted about 11 minutes. He's just got one minute. He panics. He makes a guess. He gets it wrong. So this type of test taker is the usual high performing academic student who wants to get every possible question right. Even though that sounds nice um, and intuitive, um, unfortunately, it is quite counterintuitive and quite counterproductive um, on the GRE because you essentially lose out on opportunities where you could have scored um, and, well, you didn't. On the other hand, why is a more strategic test taker? He, he knows that he needs to choose his battles, and therefore he uh, gets the easy and the medium ones right. Whenever he sees a, a hard question, he marks it uh, that's a flag, sorry. He marks it 
and uh, moves on, right? And in the last three minutes of the test, he hits the review button, he looks at these three questions and does strategic guessing. Um, we will look at a few examples of strategic guessing in this session, um, but there are a lot of advanced level strategy guessing strategies um, which will help you isolate or narrow down the answers to about two to three, right, out of the five. And that will help you cut down the time it takes to solve that question. And again, remember, you don't necessarily have to do mathematics or solve a passage per se. There are ways to get to the answer really quickly if you're strategic about it. Make sense? So the next time you take a mock test, a timed mock test or a full length mock test, I would suggest trying this out. Don't be compelled to attempt every question and get it right. Rather, constantly probe for whether a question can be solved within 32, sorry, within one and a half minutes. If you feel that it's going to take more time, take a call within 10 to 30 seconds to mark the question and move on to the next question. You want to ensure that you get every easy and medium question, uh, medium difficulty question right. And that makes a lot of difference. That can make the difference. For example, This guy, you know, I'm again extrapolating quite a bit, I'm speculating quite a bit, but this guy probably got a 140 to 145 on his verbal section. This guy probably got a 155 plus. And that's the kind of difference um, performing really well on the first section can make to your score. Uh, because if you get a hard section in their second section, you are going to get a good score irrespective of how you do in the second section, right? Okay, so let's do more closely at the verbal reasoning. Again, like I said, a lot of you had asked for verbal reasoning. reasoning specifically and had a lot of concerns about them. Um, so I will address all these issues. If you have more questions, please, please feel free to ask them during the Q&A session, right? Okay, so um, to, to look at the question types, you'll realize that the GRE verbal is split into three different parts. Uh, well, you could actually split them into two parts, right? That, that divide, this part and that part. Um, so the left part is essentially vocabulary-based questions. Um, they're essentially fill-in-the-blanks, different types of fill-in-the-blanks questions. And the right side is reading-based or critical reading-based questions. Critical reading-based questions uh, contain reading comprehension questions and also critical reasoning questions. Now the thing is that you're, you may have up to five passages. Let's say there are four passages um, and 10 questions. Well, because it's 50% of each section. So four passages and 10 questions. So if I say I'm gonna spend about four minutes, which doesn't sound unreasonable to read a passage, um, then that's 16 minutes plus uh, 1.5 minutes per question. That's 15 minutes, right? And again, these sound like reasonable numbers to solve a passage. But when you actually do the mathematics here, you realize that that's 31 minutes. So you have only 30 minutes to do the entire section, and this just does not work. Um, so the key here is to understand that you are not expected to read as you do in everyday life. If you read as you do everyday life, you will need about four to five minutes to just read the passage. But you don't have that luxury. In, in fact, you have about a minute or a minute and a half to read and comprehend the passage before you go to the questions. And before you ask me this, yes, you're going to have to read the passage first for most reading comprehension passages um, before you go to the question for various reasons. I'll talk about that. Uh, for critical reasoning questions, though, it's a little different. Um, 
for again for various reasons. I don't want to get into that because it will distract us from the focus of today. Right. So what we will do is we look at this aspect, which is vocabulary-based questions. The biggest challenge with them, and also we look at reading comprehension specifically. Um, again, I will not go into critical reasoning now because it's a it's quite a voluminous discussion, um, and I'll need a separate session just for that. About two to three hours just for that to get you to understand the basics and the, the core ideas of critical reasoning. So I'm going to target those and give you some very useful tips and tricks that will help you score better in these question types. And these are stuff that will work for every single GRE question of that type. Um, and um, and it's very, very um, effective in getting you 100 percentage accuracy, um, assuming that your vocabulary is well built and you're able to concentrate through that. Right? Again, we will discuss the challenges as well as we move on. Uh, so taking a closer look at the question types, this is a text completion question. Again, for those who've taken the test already, you will be sort of, you will be aware of this. You would have, you recognize that you've probably learned these things already. But for those who haven't, well, I, I want to educate you on this um, before we go into the strategy discussion. So um, you have three types of text completion questions. Now, there are single blanks, just as you see here, double blanks, and triple blanks, just as you see here. Um, now, these text completion questions can be anywhere from one sentence to about six sentences long. So they end up being like short passages. Um, for a single blank question, you will have one blank and five answer options, right? Um, you're supposed to pick one right answer. In this case, it's approbation, uh, which is the right answer. One right answer for that blank, straightforward. Um, the second question type, of course, is the multiple blank questions. In this case, as a triple blank question. Um, you will have three answers um, for each blank that you can choose from. Remember, the thing about GRE is when there are multiple options, um, and there are multiple ways, multiple ways to select them. It does not give you partial scores. You have to get every one of those answers right. So in this case, the answers happen to be this, um, this, and this, right? So instead, if I had picked these three, if I had gotten these two right and this wrong, you don't get any points. You don't get two thirds of the points. No, you didn't solve the question right. So therefore, GRE decides that you do not get any points. That can be quite devastating. Uh, so if you, in fact, if you're if you're familiar with probability and counting, um, you would realize that there are three into three into three. That's 27 different ways of answering this question. Only one way is correct. So if you were to guess in this question type, it's very, very unlikely that you'll get it right. Um, so you need to be really, really sure of what you're doing and how to break down sentences and be very accurate with the predictions that you make before you go to the answer options. Again, you want to avoid intuitive biases. What I mean by intuitive bias is that you answer based on what your gut feels. Um, and that usually leads to devastating errors on the GRE because remember the GRE is a tricky test. It's designed by psychometrists, psychologists essentially, and they know how you think. And they will tie in answer options there which are likely to agree with your intuition and first guess of sorts. But if you work with a process, if you follow a very organized and strategic method, you will never fall for those traps. And that's essentially what I want to discuss here. And when initially when you discuss, when one of you discuss that, you know, a verbal seems so subjective, that is the reason. Because we make, in everyday life, we make a lot of intuitive guesses. That works in everyday life. But on the GRE, you cannot afford to do that. If you do that, you're likely to pick the wrong answer. Right? So this takes us to the next question type, which is the sentence equivalence question type. So you'll notice that the, there are six answer options. You will be, you will see boxes, check boxes. right next to that. Um, and what that suggests is that there could be more than one right answer. In this case, there are two right answers. 
um, only to no more, no less. And the morphology of the question is that there is one sentence and one blank, no more. Um, and you have to pick two right answers out of the six options provided. The two options have to create a meaning in context that's very similar to each other. So what that means also is that these two words need not be synonyms. By definition, they might be very different, but in context, they'll create a very similar meaning. Um, again, there is no partial points. So if you select one of those right and one of those wrong, no points. Uh, you have to select both of the right ones. Now, it looks quite harmless, this question type, right? If you try probability again, you'll realize that the probability of getting this is, getting this right by chance is one in 30. Or am I wrong? Yes, one in 30, which is much lower than the previous question type that we saw. Uh, because there are six ways to pick the first one and five ways to pick the second answer. One in 30, that's, that's quite small. So again, you cannot be random in your approach. You cannot guess uh, without um, a proper methodology. Right? And you have to have a very organized way in which you approach this question, or you're very likely to a lot of mistakes in this question type. Then you have reading comprehension. So on the day of the test, you're going to see the passage to the left and the, and the questions to the right. Um, it will tell you how many questions are attached to that passage. Um, and the forms of these questions can be quite different. So this is the usual form, which is the multiple uh, choice question. Five answer options, one right answer. Um, you have a multiple um, response questions, again, you have a checkbox here, uh, three answer options. Now, the thing is, you could have one right answer, two right answer, or three right answers, right? Um, and the key is you have to pick all of the right answers, none of the wrong answers. Sounds a little daunting, but once you understand what's being tested, how to objectively approach this question, there will be no doubt as to which the right ones are and which the wrong ones are. Again, we will discuss that strategy in a bit. Um, also, is um, the select and sentence question. So this question type does not have any answer options. Rather, when this question comes, the sentences in the passage become selectable, right? As you hover over them, they will highlight, um, and you have the ability to click uh, one of these answer options, and it will stay clicked when you click it. Um, that clicked portion will contain the answer to that question mentioned. That's essentially the idea. Again, from a format perspective, this is the easiest and the simplest um, question type um, that you that the GRE throws at you. OK, so what challenges exist? Well, this might, again, resound with most of you already. You've taken the test. Um, if not, here, are what, here is what you're up against. Number one is test taking stamina. So I, I often joke about how the GRE is like running a, running a marathon, but you've got to sprint the entire way, right? Um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's sort of a mental gymnastics that you have to do, and it's a four hour experience. Building that stamina is one of the biggest challenges that students have, because um, you may be able to solve questions in sets, uh, but when you're put in that four hour experience, your mind just stops working at its optimal level after a while. 
Um, that does not mean it's all bad news, of course. Your mind can be trained uh, for that experience. And one of the best ways to do that is, of course, to take a lot of full-length mock tests and prepare yourself for that experience. Try to make your practice as test day-like as possible. Right? Again, I will talk more about this uh, shortly. Second is that of time management. Like we saw with reading comprehension, it is very easy for you to run out of time if you're not strategic about your approach. Remember to mark your questions as often as possible. Move on to easier questions and me, uh, yeah, move on to easier questions and get them right. That should be a priority. Don't worry about solving or putting 100% on a hard question because you just don't have the time and the return on investment is really, really low uh, when you actually think about how the test is designed. A third concept, a third thing to be worried about is stress. Well, ironically, um, you're very likely to be at a level of stress on the day of the test. Think about this, this is a big day, it's gonna define your career or your learning, your, um, yeah, your learning or academic path for the foreseeable future. Um, and doing well here really, really matters. Probably you're stressed about how you performed in the previous section when you're going to a verbal section perhaps. Um, perhaps you forgot to have your breakfast. There could be so many things that stress you out. Um, uh, the thing is that when things do get stressful, we are less likely to be um, to perform at our optimal level, right? Uh, have, do you remember reading something after a fight? It's very hard to do that, right? Uh, similarly, when you're very, very agitated or very stressed, your brain stops being able to comprehend things. So that's another fact, and you need to know how to deal with it um, and how to uh, preempt most of these stress factors and sort of chuck them out even before they happen. Um, next, the, the, the passages and the text that you're likely to come across on the GRE are not gonna be straightforward. For example, your, your reading comprehension is not going to say, I believe that this is, you know, this is my opinion. Your passage is never gonna say that. In, in fact, it'll be very convoluted in the way it expresses its opinion. It'll be very complex how they address um, address points. And also what they would, what they usually do is that they hide the main idea under a lot of distracting details where we, by intuition, go and read those details and think that they are, that they are important, um, which is actually quite counterproductive. Again, more of this will be discussed with reading comprehension. And of course, complex vocabulary. Um, the thing is, on the day of the test, you're going to see vocabulary that you've never seen before, or words that you don't come across in everyday life. For example, what does the word prosopagnosia mean? Or sesquipedalophobia, probably fear of something. Uh, but yeah, these are words you've never, probably never heard before. Um, or you might hear words that you've heard before, but they're used in contexts that are weird. For example, you've heard of the word pedestrian, right? As someone who walks. But if I said his latest movie is quite pedestrian, um, well, that doesn't make sense. It's not walking anywhere. Um, instead, it's used as an adjective to mean that it, it is quite um, ordinary, nothing amazing or nothing out of, the, out of the world, right? So there are many of these words which have secondary meanings and the G and GRE has a liking of testing secondary meanings of many of these words. So you need to know what these words are and how they're used on the GRE. Also, another challenge is that GRE vocabulary is completely context-based. Um, mugging up definition just does not work. on the day of the test, or for the day of the test. All right, so let's look at what we should do. So some preliminary things to keep in mind. Start early, don't put off preparation for the GRE for the last minute. Ideally, I would say keep at least two months of buffer time uh, for preparation for the GRE. Um, last minute preparation really does not work. Why? Because it's a test of strategy. It's not a test of 
concept or content. Um, it's a test of strategy beyond everything else. Sure, there's mathematics and vocabulary and verbal, but you'll realize that mathematics is very elementary level. It, it's probably eighth, le eighth or tenth standard level at most. And verbal reasoning, well, it has fill in the blanks and reading comprehension, which is quite straightforward, right? We've been doing that since childhood. But the way they test you, of course, is what's complicated. They will, um, they will give you questions that are quite tricky and cognitively um, create traps that you're very likely to fall for. So focusing on strategy is what's important, not theory itself. Um, third, make your practice test day like and take periodic full and test. This is very invaluable. Don't solve questions in a way that you solve one question, then go to the answers and check what it is. That's counterproductive. In fact, uh, it, rather pick about 20 questions, time yourself, right? Uh, if it's a reading comprehension uh, passage, then probably you know multiply the number of questions into two. This includes the time that you will um, spend reading the passage. So that will be your time. Time yourself, take the entire sectional test, and then evaluate yourself. Then spend as much time as you spend taking the test, reviewing it afterwards. So when you review, you're going to think about what, uh, what are the reasons you went wrong, and more importantly, why the wrong answer options are wrong in the first place, because the logic with which the GRE tests you will keep repeating. There are some things that don't change, the rationale don't change. Finally, be consistent with your preparation. So it's not enough if you sit uh, for eight hours a day uh, for a week and prepare. Um, very likely that the effort resulted from that would not be as fruitful. Instead, if you can spend about one and a half to two hours a day um, for four to five weeks, for four to five days a week, uh, for about two months, you'll realize that your competency in, um, in the GRE as a whole substantially increases. And that's what matters, because at the end of the day, it's a test of strategy. It's about how your behavior towards the test changes and how you habituate yourself rather than the theory or the technical knowledge that you know. Right? Um, and therefore, be consistent in your preparation. So that said, you'll realize that one of the biggest factors um, that might have put you off when you were preparing the GRE was, um, was vocabulary. So let's look at that. Let's look very closely at vocabulary itself. And um, more importantly, let's see why it's important. Right? Um, so look at this question. What I want you to do, of course, is a text completion question. What I want you to do is before we go into the answer options, um, I want you to figure out what word could fill um, this particular blank. Um, take, about, take about 40 to 50 seconds or even a minute to solve this. Once you're done, uh, Type out your predictions. I don't want to know what the answers are, right? Don't worry about the answers. Rather, um, tell me what word should fill in here. And you'll have a discussion about it and, uh, and figure out how to take it from there. Okay, um, so can anyone tell me what your prediction for um, for this blank could be? What could fill in this? Anyone? Forget about the answer options. Um, well, we are very likely to get it wrong. That's the point here. Um, in, you are very likely to get the predictions right, though. I want to find out what your prediction for the word to fill this up is. Forget about the answer options here. Don't worry about that. I want your own word. And you'll remember that this is um, part of the process of solving these question types. Uh, unworthy, OK. Uh, but it says. But the sentence clearly says that although worthy of attention, it is worthy of attention. So unworthy is a direct contradiction of that, don't you feel? 
So we need some other word. So you're right. You're right in that it's not something that should be given too much attention for. So what is that thing that the uh, the author gives too much attention for? Anyone? What is that one thing? The author here, of course, the question here is about what the you know what the author is concerned about. That's the target here. So what do we know about the concern? What is he concerned about? Extra, well, yes. Can you, can you pick up a word from the sentence itself? Which word um, means, uh, which word from the sentence, from right here, uh, does he think is not necessarily relevant? Characters close, very good. Um, very good. So characters close. So essentially your prediction here could be such clo cloth related concerns, right? Or you could say relevant, but then he does say it's worth worthy of attention. So not so relevant, irrelevant. Let's just go with that then. Uh, close rated or irrelevant concerns. We can use both of those, right? Um, so the next step is to look at the answer options. Of course, um, let's look at that. Or let me just clear that out. Okay. Um, so we want clothes related or irrelevant. Let's look at the answer options. Any guesses? Let me just put out a quick poll. Yellow? Okay. Okay. So a lot of you have gone with syntactical and irrelevant. Fair enough. D. Okay. Fair enough. So then we come back to the sentence, right? Irrelevant here is a trap. And that's why I sort of entertained that uh, guess. Notice how it says, although worthy of attention. Right? Um, if something is worthy of attention, then you wouldn't call it irrelevant. It's a little too harsh, don't you think? Instead, it's something that is not worthy of complete attention. It's something that is not the most important thing. And that is not irrelevant, right? So irrelevant is too extreme and is therefore eliminated. Right? So what happens is when you do not know the uh, meaning of some words, you end up picking the one that you're familiar with. That's not the right way to go though. Right. So uh, we can safely eliminate C. Didactic means to instruct. Uh, for example, if um, before you start a GRE passage, you're likely to see a didactic text that tells you exactly what to do um, and what your goal in that question type is. Instructional text is didactic. Um, so that has nothing to do with clothes. Syntactical, like in a syntax, you, you know what that is in programming, you have syntax and grammar, you have syntax, a set of rules, a guideline, right? Um, that has nothing to do with clothes either. Frivolous is to lack seriousness. Now you could say, well, he, he is concerned about frivolous things, uh, but then again, it doesn't mean clothes. Again, when you're, when you're not very sure of the words, you're, you end up very likely to pick an answer option that you think could be, could be the right thing, right? But rather the right answer here is sartorial. Sartorial directly means related to clothes. Um, and as you predicted, it's the most obvious, most direct answer right there. The, the problem of course is that, you know, these words might as well have been in Japanese for all I care, because these words are not words that you've come across in everyday life. And that's one of the biggest challenges about the GRE, that you come across words that you've never or rather, you, you are given or you're asked words that you've never come across in your everyday life. Um, so that's one thing you need, to be, you need to watch out for. So even though breaking down the sentence was quite obvious, the answer options can be quite tricky, right? So that's one of the reasons why vocab building is very important. Second, this is a sentence equivalence question. Um, so let me work with you on this, right? And uh, to, so you'll also sort of learn how to work with these uh, vocabulary-based questions from a strategy perspective. So the sentence says, always circumspect. So the word circumspect, um, 
where is that notification? Okay, so why not frivolous? Well, frivolous means lacking seriousness, um, and that doesn't necessarily mean says. So to go back to, to the previous slide, um, we realized that the key was that it was related to the clothes um, of the character, right? Uh, frivolous may work, right? But it's not the most specific answer here. Remember, you need to answer based on the information provided in the sentence itself. And the only information we know about this particular concern that he has is that it's related to clothes. And so total directly means that, right? So this is exactly why you need to follow process. You need to be able to predict based on information given and not based on intuition. Right? If you go by intuition, you will probably pick up in irrelevant or frivolous because they both make sense, but they're not accurate in this context. So let's go to the next one. Um, so the question is, always circumspect. She was reluctant to make judgments, but once arriving at a conclusion, she was something in its defense. So what is the target? What is the blank here talking about? It's about the conclusion uh, she arrives at, right? Um, how is she in its defense? What do we know about this conclusion? Well, we know that she Um, is very reluctant to make judgments. And we also know there's a trigger word called but. So she's very reluctant or hesitant to make judgments. She, she hesitates or is very shy to come out with her own opinion. But when she does come out with her opinion, how is she in his defense? Can someone tell me what could fill this blank? Forget about the answer options. Uh, what could fill, what word of your own could fill this blank? How was she in his defense? Was she judgmental in her defense? That doesn't seem right. So we know that she was reluctant. So look at the word reluctant. That's your key here. She was reluctant to make judgments. But when she did make a judgment, how was it in its defense? Did she defend it? Um, in what? How did she defend Did she defend it at all or did she defend it quite strongly? She was quite confident, right? She was quite strong. Oh, absolutely, because the word but there suggests that a contrasting uh, Um, idea is taking place, a contrasting cause and effect is taking place there. Um, absolutely, right? Um, so we need a word which means strong in its defense. Take a few seconds to go through the answer options. You need two right answers, mind you. Um, take a few seconds. I will release a poll where you can put out your answers.
Remember, there are two right answers here. Again, the key is to pick both of them. Pick two answers. Hmm. Very nice. So I see a lot of you have picked the correct options. That's good to see. Very good. Yes. Uh, so what you realize is the, the most trending answers here, you can call that, are intransigent and resolute. But look at the word, intransigent. Trans is to move. Intransigent is unmoving, to be stubborn, right? Whereas resolute is to be very strong-willed, to not waver in your beliefs. Um, it's a very positive word. Intransigent can be negative in some context. Um, stubborn, very strong, very, uh, very reliable, right? By themselves, if you look at the definition, they mean very different things. They mean very, very different things. But in context, when I put them back in the sentence, you'll realize that they mean very similar things in context. And that's what matters on the GRE. And you're right. Intransigent and resolute are the right answers. Very good. So um, what do we learn from this? Well, that context is what matters. Definition. Well, not really. Um, if you're going to spend your time memorizing definitions, you're not going to have a good time on the GRE because it really does not test definitions. Since we're here, let's look at the other answer options. Differential. Have you heard of this statement? She gives a lot of differential treatment to the new employees. Right? Different meaning different in the sense that you are partial towards them, something that's very different from what's normally given to others. So partial means differential. Lax is like the word relax. Very good, yes, bias. Uh, lax means very similar to relax. Uh, so lax is without a strict follow-up of things, to be very relaxed and laid back is lax. Negligent, well, similar to the word negligence or neglect to not pay attention to, to, to almost a criminal degree. Well, I'm a, being a little exaggerating here, but to not necessarily be very um, concerned about important things, to be negligent. Obsequious is, uh, well, the root here is sequ word similar to sequence and uh, well a sequence follows right obsequious is when someone sort of blindly follows or sheep like a sheep follows someone else um, without questioning and without having their own thoughts obsequious to be slavish um, Yeah, to be um, yeah, to be slavish. I can't think of a better word right now, right? So does that make sense? Do these answer options make sense? Um, because remember, on the day of the test, you are not looking for synonyms. Necessarily, and you're not expected to choose based on definitions, but rather common. Dogmatic Kamal is a very different, um, it's used in a very different context um, because it, um, it means to be um, opinionated or bas basically strongly supporting your opinions or beliefs, usually used in contexts of politics and religion. Um, so those don't necessarily make sense in this context, right? All right, let's go to the next one.
and another one. So again, um, let's make a prediction and then go to the answer options and see how those work, right? Um, so the prediction here should be for the sentence. For some time now, something has been presumed not to exist. Well, uh, the explanation for that is that the cynical or the pessimistic uh, conviction that everybody has an angle is considered wisdom. So what does this figurative phrase, everybody has an angle mean? Anybody? Absolutely, every person, very good. Everybody has a very different, uh, their own opinion, their own point of view. In other words, no one is going to be, well, unbiased, right? Everyone is biased towards something. Um, so if it is common knowledge or it's considered wisdom that everybody has a, a bias, then what has been presumed not to exist? If everyone is biased, what does not exist? Perhaps lack of bias? Yeah. So what I want you to do is that is your prediction, lack of bias or um, own opinion, right? And that is what has been um, has been missing. Um, so with that in mind, go to the answer options, eliminate as many as you can. Um, let's discuss what the answer should be. Again, in about a few seconds, I will release the poll for it. Okay. That's interesting, okay. I do see that some of you have picked the right answer. All right. Okay, actually, a lot of you have picked the right answer now. <laughs> That's an even split between or uh, among flexibility, indifference, and disinterestedness. So look at flexibility. Flexibility means having, um, being able to change, uh, being able to be flexible. Well, that has nothing to do with opinion per se, right? Um, or lack of opinion. In fact, in fact, I would say uh, flexibility has nothing to do with being unbiased. Um, and for that reason, I would say that it's out of scope. Get rid of it. Flexibility and ha not having an opinion are not the same things. Um, it's out of scope. <clears throat> um, diffidence. Uh, diffidence is sort of the opposite of the word confidence. You could think of it that way. To lack confidence in self, to be shy, right? Uh, that does not mean lacking bias. That's out. Looking at the other two answer options, rationality is actually a trap. It's uh, it's quite interesting to see that very few of you have selected rationality, uh, because a lot of people would think, you know what, what has you know, if you're not having a bias, then uh, you're if you're biased, then you're irrational. That's that's many people's perspective, but that's not the truth. Um, bias and rationality are, or irrationality are very different things. The sentence is not talking about irrationality, but rather bias, and therefore rationality is out. Similarly, insincerity is also out because we're not talking about being insincere or cheating, but rather that you are biased towards something. Only the word disinterestedness makes sense. <clears throat> so you'd ask me, what does this word mean? Doesn't it mean not interested? Well, the, the word uninterested means that. On the GRE, um, disinterested, is tested with one specific meaning, which is not having vested interests, or in other words, not being biased or partial. For instance, a disinterested judge is going to be a very good judge because he is impartial to all the people involved, right? So disinterested is to be differentiated from uninterested. It means to be impartial um, or unbiased. 
Make sense? And this is the right answer for this question. Right. Any, any doubts for this? Okay, let's move on to the next. So again, the point here was that, uh, the point here in the previous question was that, you know, um, you may be very sure of the words you may be very clear about the words you have but sometimes you're likely to be thrown a googly in that you will see a word that you know but a secondary meaning would be tested that you're not aware of and that will lead you to make some really bad assumptions which will lead to well wrong answers uh, well, knowing the meaning of the, all the answers is actually the last step, uh, technically. Right? Uh, because you can still solve part of the question, but obviously to get the answer right, you need to know what these answers are. And like I said, if you don't know what the answer options mean, you might as well be doing it in a foreign language. It really doesn't matter because you really don't know what the answer options mean. And yes, you're right. To know the answer options is very important if you want to get it right. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's actually the point. I am going to show you how to Build vocabulary and well, where to build it from. Um, let's try this out. Um, <clears throat> the plan which the engineers said would save the aquifer. So, aquifer is a well, a bottle. water body. Um, by reducing pumping to some kind of levels has passed the governmental environmental review but faces opposition from outdoor and environmental groups. So I want you to make your prediction here. So remember the step is always to first make a prediction here and then evaluate the answer options, right? Don't do it the other way around because you're very likely to make mistakes um, if you do it the other way around. It is, it is a tricky test. Trust me on that. Um, so. Try it out. Once you're done, don't give me the answers. I'll release a poll. You can answer there. Um, but in about, you know, try it out. Once you're done, just let me know if you're done. Uh, don't tell me what the answer is. Just let me know if you're done. I'm guessing you're done, right? Okay, let's, um, but yeah, you said harmless. That's That's good because that was not the answer. That's the prediction. You're right. You're right, Sai. That's good catch there. Um, so since you've said it, let me 
point it out, right? So they want to reduce it to some kind of levels. That's the target here. Um, why? Because they want to save the aquifer. Um, and what is implied here is that um, they are harming the aquifer by pumping too much. So they want to reduce the pumping to, um, to a level that does not harm the aquifer anymore. So harmless is the best prediction, I think, um, um, to be made. So let's look at the poll, match that prediction with your answer. options and let's see again remember this one requires two answer options um, not just one now quiz Give me one second please be right there There you go. Hmm? One of the options is not there. Okay. 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 Um, remedial is a trap. Minimal is also a trap. I don't think that got registered in the poll. Um, well, the thing is, think about it. Minimal would suggest that it's a very small amount, but do we know that it's harmless? We don't. Maybe even a minimal amount could be harmful. Um, we are not sure. The context suggests that it has to be harmless. Minimal does not mean harmless. So that's eliminated. Um, practicable and feasible are also traps. These are viable or levels that to which you can possibly uh, um, pump. But ideally, if you pump to practicable and feasible levels, it would harm the aquifer. Um, it would be efficient for the pumping, not for the aquifer. So that's traps as well. Those are traps as well. Um, well, remedial is a trap because, well, you're not going to fix anything by reducing your pumping to a low level, right? You're only trying to prevent harm, not fix something. Remedial is to fix things that does not make sense. It's innocuous and benign, which means harmless. That's the right answer. So what you have realized is there are a lot of traps here. Feasible, practicable, minimal, innocuous, and benign. They're all very close. And you will be asked to pick among those really close answer options on the day of the test. So it is very important to make a very precise prediction. It's also very important to um, know that differences between words and make choices based on that right um, 
that's pretty much it. So one of the questions is should we eliminate or choose right answers? The always on the GRE look for eliminating wrong answer options because if you're trying trying to choose right answers, you are very likely to fall for certain intuitive biases. You're likely to choose an answer option that sounds nice or goes with your gut rather than what the method itself allows, right? So all always try to eliminate as much as possible what you're left with, um, even though it seems very improbable. will be the right answer. Okay. So for a sentence equivalence question, you must spend no more than one minute per question. For a text completion question, depending on the complexity, You could spend anywhere from 45 seconds for a single blank to up to one and a half to two minutes on a triple blank, right? Um, it is entirely dependent on the context. So on average, I would say about a one and a half minutes per question, on average. So how do you build vocabulary? Well, what are the things you need to know to develop your vocabulary? Number one, start early. Don't put up vocabulary building for the last minute, not the last week, not the last month start as early as possible, right? Because this is long-term memory building um, and it has to be meaningful and something that re is retained in your mind for a long period of time. For that, you need a lot of time to build it. Maintain a separate notebook for vocabulary. What that means is that you should not just rely on an app to learn your words. Um, instead, you should physically have a notebook where you write uh, the word and the definition and whatnot, which I will talk about. Um, so this ensures that you're spending time with the word, doing research, actual research, not just doing it superficially. Um, and all these will ensure that you learn the word properly and understand the context in which it is used. And you might think that, you know what, that will take a lot of time. I don't have that kind of time. Well, you don't have to spend too much time. So work on vocabulary consistently. So consistency is more important than how, you know, number of hours within a short period of time. Work about four days a week, 30 minutes a day, right? And spend this 30 minutes a day studying six to seven words um, in that 30 minutes. That's enough. Um, the resources I will talk about in a few minutes will help you learn a, a variety of words um, and that will ensure um, that you retain them as well in a very logical and a systematic manner in your head right uh, it will also be a very entertaining way to do it i'll talk about it when the time comes um, build vocabulary in context don't mug up definitions rather you need to understand how a word is used whether it's positive negative neutral how positive negative or neutral it is um, what kind of register it is is it formal informal all this information that's very important um, when you're attempting text completion questions. And spend one day each week testing yourself. Don't just go through the words again and, um, and, and go to the definitions and see what makes sense. Instead, um, look at look at testing yourself. Cover the definition. Try to guess or try to predict what the definition of a word should be. That is a much better way to test yourself and recall the meaning of a word and learn it. Um, about GRE about GRE vocabulary resources, I will share them with you. Um, I will show you what kind of resources are uh, well resources make sense. After the session, I will also send you a sort of a care package with all these relevant materials that you can refer back to. All right, so what are these resources? Like you just said, um, I really use word lists. Do word lists are good? I will send you a word list, um, and this word list will have about 300 words, and these are the most frequently used words 
um, and high impact words, right? Focus on those and build from there. That's the idea. Um, use word lists though as checklists. Don't use them as um, don't use them as a place where you learn the word itself. Don't memorize the definition. in the word list. Instead, go and do research on those words. That's very important. Second, use vocabulary.com for context. And that's a brilliant resource. I'll show you how it's used. Uh, but using that will ensure that you learn the usage of a word and how it's used in actual everyday sentences. There's a website called visualthesaurus.com. That's a great way to learn related words. I can show you how that works. And family of words that are related to this. Um, this will expand your horizons of vocabulary building quite substantially because at the end of the day, your mind wants to make connections. Um, and this website essentially gives you that opportunity. To build connections with other related words. Third, learn words in groups. Um, so when I said you are going to focus on these 300 plus words, um, you're also going to do something where you're going to clump up similar words um, into groups. Right? Uh, again, I can send you a package with, uh, with word groups as well. So what happens is that in English, Uh, for a particular concept or an idea, there are multiple words, you know, up to even 10 to 20 words that describe very similar things. If you can clump them up together and sort of remember them as one unit, it becomes very simple for you to be able to make educated guesses. Even if you're not very sure of a word, you can still make an educated guess. Uh, worst case scenario, uh, and get the question or the answer right. And that's very important. So word groups are a very useful tool to learn a volume of words meaningfully, contextually uh, for the GRE. And of course, something called etymology, but this is the study of roots. Um, I will show you examples of how this works. Again, I'll send you a list of such words and how to uh, study them after the examples are described. And perhaps, you know, all these things are very useful to learn words in context and you'll understand the meaning of the words but you are very likely to come across situations where you don't you're not able to recall the meaning of a word uh, when you see it right uh, you know the meaning you know the idea it represents but you just are not able to recall what its definition is This is very common. What you want to do is create mnemonics. Mnemonics are memory uh, tools or memory triggers. And if it's too hard for you to create memory triggers, you can use this website, mnemonicdictionary.com, that has user generated. mnemonics, um, which um, which essentially are up and they're very useful for you to help remember words effectively. So how should your vocabulary notebook look? Well, you should have
a word with the defin well with the definition um, and of course related words. It can be sermons, it can be roots, it can be family. words from Israel thesaurus, but most important is that um, usage. Um, use vocabulary.com to find the actual usage of the word and write down one sentence or context that makes sense to you. So um, the word must make sense just by looking at the sentence. It should tell you whether it's a positive or negative word, in what kind of context it's used, right? So uh, let's look at an example of that. So the word I checked on vocabulary.com is conscientious, right? It, it, it gives me a very good educational description of what that word is. Go ahead and read that. Um, not now, of course, when you use vocabulary.com. It's a very informative piece on how this word should be used or what it means. More important is when you scroll down, You will see this section usage from actual um, well actual published material, and you will see the usage of these words in such actual materials. Um, what this does is it shows you how this word is used. More importantly, what it means. and how that meaning is conveyed um, in context. Find one, you will be able to scroll through multiple layers of such usages. Uh, find one that works for you, that you are able to relate, and write it down in your vocabulary notebook. You'll realize how useful it is once you start doing it. Um, we will address scholarships in a bit. Maybe in the Q&A section, we can dedicate some of the time to talk about that. Okay, um, this is visualthesaurus.com. Um, essentially, putting in a word there will help you understand family of words and uh, will sort of show you what words are exact opposites and related by family to these um, words. Similarly, you can research on various other words to learn a lot of related words. It's a great tool. I urge you to check it out. So when we do send the resources, I'll send you the links for these as well. And this is mnemonicdictionary.com. Where things are voted based on popularity um, and the best mnemonic or explanation of how to remember is on the top, right? So do check it out if you're stuck, uh, if you're not able to recall the meaning of a word consistently. The news mnemonic, to remember it better. So um, sure, use your app, but the thing is, if you're using that, only using that to learn and remember the word, it will be very, um, it may not be very effective. Uh, like I said, contextual meaning is very important. If you're not able to recall that, if you're not able to understand the contextual meaning, uh, then you will not find that time that you've spent as productive. What's the point if you do spend time with it, but it's not usable on the day of the test? So even if you're using the app, make sure you have a vocabulary notebook where you write down things and you know, find actual usage, not just like dictionary 
dictionary.com definitions, but actual usage from vocabulary.com. And this is very, very useful. Um, and you will realize that your accuracy substantially improves as you start learning the contextual usage of words. Okay, so um, let's move on to the next thing, which is um, yeah. So we will talk about it absolutely, Mike. Um, learning words or etymology. So uh, I spoke about etymology a little while back. Etymology is essentially the study of the roots or origin of words in the English language, right? Why is this study important? Well, it actually isn't, but to understand the science behind how a word originates is useful because a lot of words are connected and knowing the base forms can help you remember and recall words very, very effectively. And I will demonstrate that with a few examples. Um, So to, looking, to look at the basics, you have three forms or three things in etymology. You have the prefix, um, suffix, and um, basis. So the prefix comes before, suffix comes later, base is the core word itself. Uh, for example, if you look at the word impeccable, the word impeccable means uh, without even one flaw, to be unblemished. For example, if I sell my phone in impeccable condition, it will get the best price possible. Looking at the roots, im means without, in this case it means without, peka means fault. There's a word called peccadillo or um, peccable, which means with flaws, peccadillo means small flaws or a white, like a white uh, lie is a peccadillo, a small sin. Able is able to. So when something is impeccable, you're not able to find even one flaw, right? So that's what it means. Uh, second, disingenuousness, this, not, in could either mean not or excessive amounts of. For example, if something is flammable, it can burn. If something is inflammable, um, it, it will burn quite uh, quite briskly. Um, um, in this case, it means excessive amounts of. Genuous means to be, well, it's not the word genuine, it's to be very frank. So ingenuousness is to be very frank. Disingenuousness means to be, well, uh, disreputable to be a cheat, right? Make sense? So that's how the roots work. Let's look at a few examples and take things from there. So this is a very, very... Um, fun way to learn words and also very useful and effective way to learn words. Um, so the root here is loqui, which means to talk. Um, loquacious, O-U-S is to be full of a particular quality. Loquacious, therefore, means to be talkative. Um, eloquent, E-U, the root, means to be Refined or fine, eloquent, therefore, is to be very persuasive in your speech, is to talk very fluently, right? Soliloquy, solo, is single or self. You must be aware of that. So, soliloquy, therefore, could mean what? Well, it means um, to talk to oneself. Monologue. on the other hand, is a single speaker. So when someone speaks for a very long time and they're the only one speaking and no one else interacts, it's a monologue, like a, like a lecture, it's a monologue. A dialogue is when more than two people are involved or two or more people are involved in conversations and everyone discusses ideas. The word grand eloquent and man eloquent 
have roots which show that they are grand. Or pompous or over the top. And that's what it means. To be grand eloquent or magna eloquent means to be very flashy in your use of language, to use very big, bombastic words, to use language that is very over the top, right? The key is to, well, the key is they're trying to be, um, um, the key is that they're trying to be um, a short. One second there, yeah. Colloquial um, is to be, um, well, co, like a co-worker. Okay. Colloquial means to talk with someone who is your equal, right? Colloquial. Um, so you're in formal, you're casual in the way you speak. Or blocky, ob is against, like obstruct is against. Um, or blocky is to uh, talk against something. to publicly denounce someone or blocky. Some lockery, like the word insomnia. Well, some insomnia is the lack of sleep, you're not able to sleep. Some means to sleep. So some lockery is to sleep talk in a sense, right? Uh, so what you realize is that just by looking at this word or root loqui, you're able to see, um, you're able to see quite um, a lot of words that are related to it. Uh, and um, as a result, learning these words becomes very, very easy. For example, if I said soliloquy, you'll immediately make the connect with solo. Means this means one single self, loqui talk. So it's someone who talks to oneself or to talk to oneself is soliloquy. Um, grand and magna means big bombastic. And therefore, they mean to be show off, um, to use big, bombastic language. Make sense? All right. So um, another set of words, circum, is around, like circumference, right? Circumnavigate. Then we have circumscribe. The word scribe is to write or draw. You would have heard of the word inscribe. which means to write inside. Um, prescribe, your doctor prescribes medication for you. Um, sub subscribe, you sign underneath the register and says, you know what, I want this um, going further, right? Subscribe, that's how it used to be done in the old days. Um, subscribe is to write. So imagine if someone drew you know, a circle around you and said, you know, You cannot move any further, right? You can't go out anywhere. You're you're to be within this particular purview that I've set. I'm circumscribing you. What am I doing to you? Well, I am limiting you. I'm constraining you. Um, and that's essentially what circumscribing means, to constrain.
or the limit. Circumlocution, the root loqui is used here. Circumlocution to talk in a way that is not to the point, right? Whether well, we are talking around in circles or beating around the bush, that's what it is. means to, to be evasive, to not get to the point directly. Um, circumvent, to essentially go away from or avoid a situation, right? So let's say there's a situation and you go around it, you circumvent it. You avoid it, that you circumvent it. Circumambulate, the word ambulate means to walk. Um, so when you circumambulate, well, it's a fancy word, which means to walk around. Um, circumspect, spectacle, well, to see. When you inspect something, you see something very precisely, uh, very closely. A spectator is someone who watches. So really circumspect, is when you look around, but that's not what it means actually. Think about it, when you're crossing the road and you look around, what are you doing? Well, you're being cautious, you're ensuring that everything is in the right place. To be cautious and to be vigilant is to be circumspect, right? So you realize that by using etymology, it becomes very easy to understand the contextual usage of words. It's a very powerful way to remember words as well. I will share those resources with you and you will find it quite useful, right? Uh, and when vocabulary is discussed, when vocabulary is taught, uh, but we, we ensure that we sort of discuss vocabulary or etymology elements as much as possible. It is very rewarding for the brain to remember these things and make connections whenever they do exist. Okay, so, Going into reading comprehension, I'm sure this is something that you've been eagerly looking for. Uh, so um, we're looking. We're going to look at some critical reading strategy and see how we can effectively use that uh, to our advantage. So before we go into that, I'd like to you know, give a couple of minutes um, you, know, you can take a break or please ask your questions now, right? Before we have a final Q&A session, um, I'd like to figure out whether you have any specific questions about the cap building or anything else that you have um, and I can clarify for For you before I start the session, um, the next part of the session, which is reading comprehension strategies.
Okay, I don't see any questions yet. So if you do have questions, please feel free to ask at any time or <clears throat> save them for the last Q&A uh, section, right? Okay, so I'm gonna give you a minute. You're gonna solve this in a minute. This is a reading comprehension passage. It's gonna take you a minute. You're going to answer that question in a minute's time. Your time starts now. That's time up. Can you answer what the question is? Can you tell me what the answer to the question is? Anyone? Drop a chat um, and let's see. I do I do want to know your answers. Can someone answer that? What do you think is the primary purpose of this passage? Okay, I don't see any responses, guys. Well, I'm gonna assume that you were not able to answer this. Uh, um, we will come back to this and discuss this, um, and we will figure out how to solve
solve this in a minute. And this is a passage that should be solved within a minute, by the way. Um, that's the kind of time frame that you'll be working on, on the GRA, right? Um, yeah, I understand. It is kind of difficult. <laughs> right. So you'll see how to deal with that once we understand a few things about the reading comprehension and um, take things from there. So let's understand how to read. That, that's the most important thing. The thing is that a lot of people Um, do it wrong. So let's compare it to what we do on an average. Okay, like what we read in everyday life, and I think about how we read, right, on each of these. Um, Um, in each of these contexts. So, uh, like I said, a minute is usually the amount of time you would be required or you'd be, uh, that would be available. Uh, for someone who reads the passage of that on the GRE. Uh, so that, that's normal time frames you're looking for, looking at. And yes, it is quite challenging. Um, so let's say, let's say you're reading a blog post. Well, you you'll realize that you, you read a blog post um, very similar to, uh, for example, a news article. You generally read it quite quickly. Uh, you're there to get the overall idea, right? Um, you read online forums. For, you know, for research purposes, perhaps, and you scan through those different uh, things that you read. Similar to Twitter, perhaps, or Facebook, where you're looking for very specific information. information. Like you don't read everything the same way. When you read no Novels and poems, you're reading for the effect of it. You're reading to understand the language, to appreciate the language, the way the author describes certain things. Um, and that's not. not 
the way you would read on the GIF course. Very counterproductive. This way is very. slow and it's there for you to get a sort of a feeling or a experience of that reading itself not really what you're looking for in the GR. Right. Looking at academic books and reference books right um, when you read such things you're there to um, understand each and every part of that book when you're reading an academic book you want to know all the details memorize them in fact because everything is going to be important you can't read for just alone Right? So this type is a very slow, and it's there for you to recall and remember a lot of things. And this will involve a lot of back and forth. You will go back and revise things that you've already read as you're reading it. Um, think about this. On the day of the test, you probably read um, the GRE passage very similar to this. And when the previous passage you were trying to read, similar to an academic book, where you... Try to read every part of the sentence. If you didn't understand something, you went back and reread it again. And you want to know exactly what every single word meant, right? Um, my question is, is that how you should read it? Well, let's see. To summarize, this is essentially the different kinds of reading. That we do in everyday life and the different things that we do this for. And the purpose for it. Blog posts and articles you read for gist, this is quite fast, you get the over view of things. Um, extensive reading is for novels and poems, I'm not going to be bothered about that because it's not useful on the GRE for obvious reasons. Intensive reading, like academic book and reference articles, you read quite intensively, right? Um, this is useful in the GRE, but in very selective aspects. Only when the question asks you for specific information, and you'll be reading intensively only one or two lines. That's it. No more. Right? Scanning is useful to find important information. But what you'll be predominantly relying on the first phase is reading for gist. Because, well, that's how you need to read. When you think about it, you'll realize that you're reading academically rather than uh, reading for a gist on the GRE, um, and that is counterproductive. Multiple reasons. One of the biggest reasons is that the details or the passage itself is not going to disappear when the questions come. Right? You don't have to remember. 
for anything per se, any details per se. You just have to be very sure of what the overall ideas are, and that's what's important. Um, but then I tell you this, that uh, you have to read for gist, and I show you passage again and nine times out of ten you're going to read it like an academic book why is that well it's just how we've been habituated we've been uh, uh, sort of ingrained or we've been trained to read uh, academically whenever there's an exam setting right and that can be counterproductive on the GRE you don't want to fall for that trap so you need to understand a method a strategy that will ensure that you read for the GRE GRE, very specifically for a GRE, read for GIST, right? And to make that point, let's look at what kind of questions that you will be tested on, not the question. Question types themselves, but the abilities tested on the GRE uh, through the questions. Right? So some of the biggest abilities tested are overall ideas, themes and purposes, overall purposes of the passage, why the author wrote this passage, what point is he trying to make, right? A purpose of a specific word, why did the author use this particular word, what point is he trying to make? Why has he introduced this particular paragraph, what point does it make? Make in the entire passage, right? So purpose, not details, but purposes. And these are not easily understandable by just reading for details. You cannot understand that by looking for details. Broad inferences, right? Um, being able to make conclusions based on, on data provided. Again, based on your analysis rather than your ability to recall information itself. Narrow inferences. Um, so inferences about very specific things said in the passage. So you realize that most of the question types expect you to understand deeper meaning or rather um, overview, not deeper meaning, sorry, overview or have a bird's eye view of the situation. Um, to think about the author's tone or the author's opinion. 